Hey everybody, this is uh, 7 6 through uh, 7 10, or however far that takes us to finish the assignment, of chapter 7. Uh, and <clears throat> last time we ended our assignment or our discussion with the concept of what's called an elastic collision when two things hit each other but bounce off um, and there's no loss of kinetic energy. However, when we have what are called inelastic collisions, and, and we're going to specifically talk about the perfectly or completely inelastic, uh, where two objects bump into each other and then they travel together as a single object. Um, we're going to talk about that, which is a little bit more common. Um, you talk about cars colliding, sometimes they do bounce off each other, sometimes the bumpers lock. So, I mean, the reality is, in the real world, we rarely have one or the other. It's almost always a combination of the two. But understanding these two specific cases allows us to understand a little bit more about how interactions do happen in the real world. How much of our energy is lost, and, and how much do the two vehicles stick together. Uh, questions like that that um, allow us to, to make good, valid um, attempts at um, understanding and predicting the behavior of vehicles or objects that bump into each other in one way or another. And we're really still focused on this concept of conservation of momentum. And that's sort of where we're going to try to maintain this idea. The good news is our inelastic collisions are actually pretty easy to evaluate. The way that it works is we take the momentum of the two individual objects. Okay, The momentum of the first object plus the momentum of the second object in this case, you're talking about what's called a ballistic pendulum, which is you shoot a bullet into a mass that's fairly heavy, and as it hits that mass, that mass is going to take the momentum that's required to be imparted to keep them traveling at the same velocity. It's going to take a lot of the speed out. And as that speed drops, okay, the object swings, and based on how high it swings, we saw a kinetic energy transformation there. So there's some things that we can do um, in terms of that that are pretty neat with ballistic pendulums. But here's the basic idea. The mass of object A times the velocity of object A at the beginning, so it's momentum, plus the momentum of the second object at the beginning. Okay, so we've got each individual momentum. Sometimes one of them's not moving and the other is. Sometimes they're both moving. It doesn't matter. They both have some momentum. It might be zero, but they have a momentum. And when we are going to add those two momentums together, the momentum of them traveling together is still conserved. And so instead of talking about mass A or mass B, we're actually going to talk about mass A plus mass B because now they're one combined object. And that will have a new velocity. We'll call it V2. Because they're together, they travel at the same velocity, their momentum is combined in this way. And this is how we would go about solving it. Unlike the elastic collisions, these are much easier to solve um, at worst, you're going to know you're going to know uh, you're going to not know one object. You can't really do too much if you don't have uh, the appropriate information. Uh, collisions in two or three dimensions. I mean, the reality is we live in a very complicated world. Um, when one thing hits another, if it hits it not dead center, they're going to deflect off of each other. The total momentum in the x direction, the total momentum in the y direction, have to be conserved. Not velocity, but momentum. And so if you can imagine object B is sitting here doing nothing, if object A hits it and deflects this way, and object B deflects that way, I know that the x direction, if we're going to call this the x direction, has to have the same momentum that I started with. And that the y momentum, if neither of these objects were moving in the y direction, then uh, both of them would. So we know that the momentums in the y direction would have to cancel because there was no momentum in the y direction to begin with. So we're looking at those kinds of things, looking at those kinds of, uh, of cancellations that we could do. I, I don't know that we're going to see any of those in our homework today, but just this understanding that momentum is conserved in the x direction and in the y direction. Therefore, the overall momentum is conserved. Uh, is a good way to approach those problems. Uh, one of these last things, I don't even know that we go past 7, 8 really. 7, 9 is too specific and 7, 10 again is fairly specific. Uh, if you're involved in anatomy and physiology, you want to know more about how the human body is built, things along those lines, um, and how our center of mass moves, I think that's great. Um, one of the things that's really interesting as we talk about center of mass um, is understanding that that is the part that's going to have a constant or, or steady uh, momentum. Um, because, you know, if I bend my for head forward, okay, 
you, you may not realize it, but as that happens, obviously I'm applying a force, but if I'm tripped, okay, legs go back, there will be a rotational uh, piece as we try to conserve our momentum. Now we apply muscles and, and things like that to try and stop all of that. But uh, you can see the diver here, the diver's center of mass, whether she just dives straight up and down or does it flip, the center of mass still travels in a projectile path due to gravity. All of the twisting and bending doesn't change what her center of mass is doing because her center of mass is only being affected by gravity. And this is why we use free body diagrams. This is why we do things along those lines. But we want to know where is the center of mass of an object and how can we use that to predict uh, location. Think about throwing knives or in this case throwing a wrench. If you've ever seen the movie Dodgeball this would be kind of funny to you. But if we throw a wrench end over end the center of mass you know, would stay in the center of the rotation, the center of the um, spin. And obviously if I'm throwing this across a room um, it would fall but this is across the table so if you can imagine this is laying on a table and I spin it and roll it or spin it and slide it across the table the center of mass is going to be defined as this point that never seems to move. So this concept of center of mass okay, uh, can be calculated in either the x direction, the y direction or, or the z direction. In any direction we can find the center of mass in that coordinate. And the way that we do that is by doing what's called a weighted average. Okay, You have to understand I don't want to know that object, so if I take like three objects, right? Okay, let's say this, and we'll say from, this is going to be zero, okay? And this will be one meter, and this will be 1.5 meters over. If I wanted the center of mass of this stick, and there's these three masses on here, this mass maybe is 0.5 kilograms, this mass is uh, two kilograms, and this last mass is uh, 1.2 kilograms, okay? The center of mass is not the middle of this, this stick. The center of mass is going to be dependent on um, how big these individual masses are. If I've got a big mass over here on the right, I mean most of my mass is over on the right of the middle, I'm, I'm clearly going to have my center of mass shift that way. And so we can actually build structures with, with center of mass in mind and make them very stable because the center of mass is where we want it to be even if there's mass maybe overhanging um, way off of a ledge. As long as the center of mass is staying where we want it to and we maintain uh, a, a way to support the strain on the structure we can build objects that look like they might topple over but are very very stable. So this concept of finding the center or center of mass is, is fundamental because that's where gravity is going to act through. All right, so if we take a look at this example problem I just made up, if we want the center of mass, so the position of the center of mass, we would take the mass of the first object, 0.5, times its position. Okay, well, if I'm measuring zero right here, I would say zero. Plus the mass of the second object, two, times its position, which would be one, plus the last mass, 1.2, times 1.5. And all of that has to be divided by the total mass. So we've got to get the mass back out so we have a position value, uh, which would be 3.7 as you add up all of those masses. Now, I don't know, actually know what this is because I just made it up, but let's find our answer. 0 0.5 times 0 plus um, 2 plus 1.2 times 1.5 gives me 3.8. And if I divide that by 3.7, I get 1.02, which means that the center of mass would be like right there, just to the right of the mass that's right at one meter, be two millimeters to the right of that. But what's cool about that is that becomes the balancing point. And so if you take like a pen and you work your way to finding that center of mass, you can find a balancing point. That balancing point helps us to make sure things are stable, make sure that things aren't going to fall over all the time. It's a very, very cool application uh, and that we want to know how to work with the center of mass. Um, and that's basically all the introduction you need. Let's look at a couple of homework problems. 
Um, I don't know if, I don't think I have adjusted the homework schedule yet um, on this. It's 31, 32, 35. Looks like we might take one or two of those off. So make sure you check the homework uh, before you get too far into it. Uh, but if we jump down here, um, inelastic collisions, um, I think 32 is a pretty good question in terms of the vertical and horizontal components of the pendulum's displacement. This is a pretty good question. Uh, 31, 32, 35. I like 35 and 36. Um, I don't really care about 35 is probably the best example of a test question. Okay, so let's take 35 and go through it. Um, you'll see some of these are kind of challenging questions. I'm sure you'll you'll have questions, and I'd encourage you to ask them. Uh, but let's take a look here at number 35. Okay, it says that a sports car, 920 kilograms. There's mass one, 920. Okay, it's going to collide with a larger vehicle that's not moving um, at 2,300 kilograms. So one of the questions we often ask uh, is, was a vehicle speeding when a collision happened? We want to understand, was this person doing something illegal or were they just inattentive? Uh, if I didn't notice a car because I was you know, trying to get something off the ground, I, maybe I dropped my phone, which by the way, hands-free, don't, don't drive and, and text or, or make phone calls. Just Give it to a passenger, um, but uh, you know if you don't if you're looking for something, or maybe you're just changing the radio station, or your kid's in the back and you're yelling at your kid. I mean, whatever it is, sometimes accidents happen that are just because of inattentiveness. Then sometimes accidents happen because of recklessness. We want to be able to distinguish between those, especially if the police are involved, knowing you know whose fault is it, but also. I mean, it's obvious whose fault it is. The car wasn't moving. You run into a park, parked object. That's your fault. But, you know, was this person someone that needs to have their license revoked or suspended? Uh, those are important questions we might want to ask. And so um, we don't know how fast the vehicle was actually moving. And that's what we want to know. What was the initial velocity of this first car? Well, we know this is the two cars, are the bumpers are going to stick together. They're going to lock together and the brakes are going to lock. So it's going to be a skid. OK, so if we just did the momentum part, Okay, the mass of the first one, 920 times VA1 plus the mass of the second, 2300 times its velocity, which we know is zero, would equal the combined mass, which would be, what, 3220, hope I did that right, times V2. They didn't tell us how fast the vehicle is sliding when it starts its slide when the combined slide. So we don't know V2 or VA1, but we know, okay, this is important stuff, that the car skid for a distance of 2.8. So there's a delta X of 2.8. We know that um, the coefficient of friction between the tires and the road, mu, is 0.8. We should be able to find some accelerations in here and maybe find the velocity. For instance, the final velocity of the cars should be zero. If we could find the initial velocity of the cars as they start to slide, that would be the V2 in our momentum problem. So we're going to have to do a little kinematics. The problem with the kinematics is I have to know the acceleration, which I don't know. But I do know Okay, I do know that the car skidded for a certain distance under the force of friction. Okay, so the force of friction we know is mu mg. And that if that's the only force acting on the cars after the collision took place as they're starting to slow down, then that must equal the mass of the vehicles times the acceleration they experience, which means this mass would cancel. And I could simply say that 0.8 times 9.8 is equal to the acceleration that the cars experience. Now this is also possible for us to do this as we look at a kinetic energy versus work theorem. 
if we talked about the work done by friction, that would equal the kinetic energy loss by the, by the cars. And if we took the kinetic energy, that's 1 half mv squared, we could solve for v that way as well. There's definitely good choices um, by multiple means here. But I know that my acceleration is now 0.8 times 9.8. So if I use my kinematics, last kinematic number 3 says v squared equals v naught squared plus 2a delta x. v squared would be my 0. I want this car to stop. v naught squared, that's the thing I need, plus 2 times 9.8 times 0.8. I'm running out of room here. I know I'm running out of room, and you probably can't see what I'm writing. Um, times delta x was 2.8. All right, so let's go ahead and grab a calculator and see if we can evaluate this. Um, we would take 2 times 9.8 times 0.8 times 2.8. Okay, so we got 2 times the acceleration, which is 0.8 times 9.8, and then times the distance 2.8. That is equal to v naught squared. I'm going to have to square root that to be able to get v naught. This tells me my initial velocity was 6.626 meters per second. Now that is immediately after the collision, which is actually v2. So right here I'd have 6.626 as our v2. If I finish solving this problem, I would times that by 3220, and then I would have to divide that by 920 to figure out just what the first vehicle had, which was 23 meters per second. Now, if we wanted to convert that into miles per hour to kind of get a sense of it, uh, we have to remember that um, a meter, you take 1,600 meters to get to a mile at 1609. So we'd have to divide this by 1609, but we'd also have to convert the seconds to hours, which would be times by 3600. So if I times this by 3600 and divide by 1609, my miles per hour would be about 52 miles an hour. Okay, so That turns me to hours. That turns me meters to miles. I mean, this car is going 52 miles an hour when they slam into the back of the SUV. Now. You also have to understand, all of the mangling of the car, all the damage to the vehicles, would be expressed as losses of energy, which means this is not the correct speed. The correct speed is significantly higher. We know this vehicle was probably extremely reckless. Uh, we should not let this person uh, be doing what they're doing. For sure, they need to take some driver's ed courses again, uh, possibly have their license suspended for a year, learn that it's not a right, it's a privilege to drive and you have to take care. I mean, it could have killed somebody. Uh, very, very likely, if they were in a v larger vehicle, uh, it could have really, really hurt the people that were in the SUV, and, and they still may have. Uh, it's a serious problem, all right? Um, we'll do one center of mass problem, and then I'm gonna set you loose. Remember to look at the assignment to see exactly what's been assigned. Um, if we jump down here to center of mass problems, I think number 46 is a uh, great question for you. Uh, 48. Um, is actually one that I want to um, take a look at. I think it's a really good example. Well, let me see. Yeah, I think that's where we're going to go. We're going to go with 48. Just kind of set it up with you. I don't know that I'll do all of it with you, but we'll set it up. So the center mass of an empty 1050 car, kilogram car is 2.5 meters behind the front of the car. So first thing I'm going to want to do is kind of have a little drawing here of my vehicle. There's my car. The original center of mass is 2.5 meters back, okay, and it has a mass of 1050. Now, guys, that means that if I were to do the center of mass calculation, 1050 kilograms is applied at 2.5 meters. We're going to use its center of mass as a starting point. Then I'm going to put two people that are 2.8 meters from the front of the car and three people that are 3.9 meters from the front of the car. And if each person is 70 kilograms, where does that shift the center of mass to? You know, does the car become less stable as we put people in it? That would be a dangerous situation. So we want to know, does it maintain a stability that's in an appropriate place? Um, we're always going to have a center of mass that's sort of towards the engine, but we can maneuver that center of mass as we add people to it. And how far back we want people to sit 
definitely affects where our center of mass is and the stability and safety of the vehicle. And so in this problem, we would take our 1050 times 2.5 plus, I'm going to add two people at 70 kilograms each or 140 times 2.8 plus three people at 70 or 210 at 3.9 and all of that is going to get divided by the total mass. Okay, I'm going to stop here and just let you guys finish making the calculation. But it'll tell us how far back in the vehicle our center of mass would be. Um, and that can tell us, you know, how likely it is that uh, a car might not necessarily roll over because that's a left-right thing that's often there, but it would help us understand um, like on a steep hill um, or on the edge of a cliff, things like that. Is it going to tip over or is it going to be stable? Um, also, we want to know, like, is the weight applied over the drivetrain? So if you think about the wheels that spin that are actually driving the vehicle, usually front wheel for a lot of vehicles, trucks will often have rear wheel drive. Is our center of mass over those wheels? Um, or are we avoiding that? That's why in, this, in the winter you'll see trucks throw bales of hay or other heavy objects in the back of a truck to help make sure they've got weight on those wheels to help increase the coefficient of friction. Anyway, um, not the coefficient of friction, but the, the, the frictional force due to increasing the normal force. All right, good luck, and we'll see you in class.